Hello one and all, and welcome to Behind the Glass, your weekly automotive podcast hosted by two rather uninformed enthusiasts. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I'm Sam from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass. I'm Tony from Gravelwood Car Sales. And you can watch us each week. We hope you enjoy the episode. This is really like like a niche and nerdy thing that none of you will care about, but we just have to declare because, well... We're recording this episode without any headphones. I last week. <laughs> we did it last week as well. Yeah. And you might think that, okay, cool. Like, who cares? It fundamentally changes the podcast recording experience for me. And me. I don't feel like we're recording a podcast. I feel like we're having a bit of an awkward conversation in a room sort of really far apart. Although this is what these podcasts are based on, mate. This is how what, we, awkward conversations. No, this is, this is how we thought about having a podcast. Yeah, no, no, because fair. we used to have these conversations, and people and now who we record it, people who watch these episodes on our YouTube channel or over on Recast often say, "Like, why are you wearing headphones? It's weird. It makes a huge difference. It makes a massive difference to the recording experience. You kind of you get absorbed by the conversation. It doesn't it, go into the privets. Yeah, and it's easier to hear when one of us wants to say something. You can give each other space and time, and it focuses you on what you're saying. And I forget my words even easier without headphones. Right. But yeah, anyway, I'll explain where they are. Well, there's a boring long story as to where, why we haven't got them. They're basically locked in a boot somewhere, but I'll get them back eventually. Um, I mean, to be fair, this is probably something we should have addressed Last week, because we didn't have them last week. Either. I actually did order a replacement set. Did you? They didn't turn up. So, <laughs> And I even went to Curry's this morning to buy Curry's? another replacement set. Yeah, Curry still exists. Who knew in the UK? Um, but they don't They don't have the right adapter for my thing. So anyway, I say really nerdy niche complaint that yeah. people are going to be like, what are you on about? But I just, we have to say it because we feel a bit, bit odd. We feel a bit strange. We are perfectionists. <laughs> We are always like the sound of our own voices. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's what we get through the headphones. Uh, how are you, mate? I'm all right. You're right. You, you, you're coping with this muggy heat that we've got in the yeah, UK? I, I like the hot weather, so. But this is not like nice hot weather. This is muggy, muggy weather. Yeah. It's close. Like my skin is perspiring. I, I'm perspiring in places that I don't want to be. Like it's just all a bit. I Tight. Need, close. Yeah, close. Yeah. Do you. <laughs> I was going to ask this question. I thought, is that too much information? Do you wear a lot of clothes at home in this weather? Like, are no, you someone... I don't wear a lot of clothes at in home. In general. Anyway. No, because <laughs> like, um, I, it's weird because I like the summer, but I don't like being hot. Yeah. Okay. So you'll get home and it, it just all comes off. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just yeah. I'll, put, I'll put a pair of shorts on or a yeah. light top or something. You, you're a fan of shorts. I don't, I like wearing clothes in general people have a go at me quite a lot because in videos i'm like oh guys it's 35 degrees i'm dying and then i'll be in like a, a long sleeve on. shirt and a jumper and, <laughs> yeah it's kind of like my go-to at le mans which we're going to talk about a lot but i've weekend. seen your legs so i'm glad you don't wear yeah. shorts <laughs> <laughs> well, that's rude that's rude my mum always said i could be a hand model to be fair she never said i could be a leg model so you might be on something there um but yeah even at le mans at the weekend it was super super hot and i was wearing a hoodie most of the time <laughs> But it was raining, mate. Yeah, yeah. That's why I was wearing the hoodie, mate. Oh, I, right. I wanted to be prepared, but it did mean that I was sweating more than usual. So, yeah, for those of you not in the UK at the moment, we have nice temperatures finally, like like spring slash summer has begun, but it just is all a bit close and muggy. And like, Is this low pressure or high pressure? No idea. Okay, well, it's, it's pressure. All, um, all, all I keep hearing all the while is global warming. It's getting too hot. I would say this is summer. That's that's what I'd say. Yeah. I'd say, uh, you know, yeah, it's 29, 30 degrees, whatever it is. It's called summer, no? I mean, it's yeah. June. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not complaining that we finally have some nice weather. Yeah. I'm, like, super excited for the months ahead. Um, I'd, I'll be honest, I'm not in the mood to wade into a bit of a... a <laughs> A semi-political climate activist conversation this no, morning. No, I just yeah. want to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> just leave that bombshell and move yeah, on. Yeah, just fine, get there out, we go. Get it out. Climate change ain't real. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Sorry, sorry. Let's, <laughs> let's focus. So, yes, at the weekend, I attended the Le Mans 24 hour, not just any regular Le Mans 24 hour race, the centenary event. 100 years of nutters driving around a track for 24 hours. How do you say Le Mans? L Le Mans. Le Mans, yeah. It's not Le Mans, because yeah. it's, I don't think, hey, 
Ah, I am not French, but it's not Les Mons. And you don't pronounce the mo- the S at the end. It's Le Mans. Or Le Mans. Or Le Mans. Le Mans? Le Mans. Le Mans. Le Mans. Le Mans. Hey, let's go with Les Mans. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear a few Americans and... Bless you guys. Uh, walking around, like, hey, it's so great to be here at the Le Mans. <laughs> Le Mans centenary. Um, they also have a great time at the Tale of Dragon. Uh, <laughs> but no, so I, there I was. Yeah, hundred years of Le Mans. It's a it's a race that I really wanted to attend for multiple reasons. You've never been before. I have. Oh, I went in twenty seventeen. I've never been. Oh, you've never been full stop. I've never been. No, I mean I know a bit about it, but. Oh, well, this is going to be very interesting. Did you watch any of it this weekend? I, yeah, I watched bits of it. Okay. I watched the start. I watched a little bit in between. And then I watched the end. Okay. So this is going to be this is going to be interesting. So you're aware of it. You haven't been. You've watched bits of it. What doesn't appeal to you about it? Because I know you watch a lot of quite niche motorsport. We don't talk about it a lot here on the podcast. And people might not be aware that you watch a lot of touring cars. And you watch yeah. a lot of the Junior Formula and Carrera Cup and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I do, yeah. So what is it about Le Mans that's never really appealed to you? Well, I just don't really know a, a great deal about it. It's an endurance race as well, isn't it? So it's not like race for 45 minutes or an hour and a half and you get an outcome. It's like literally, I know some people like they'll watch every minute of it on the television. They'll stay up and sit in their living rooms and, you know, you get people that go there religiously every year and they sleep in a tent. And I I mean, to be fair to uh, Archie, I I, I only really know about Le Mans because of him, because he's raced in it. So his grandfather, obviously one of the icons of Le Mans 24 hour. Of course. Yeah. So uh, the stuff I really know about Le Mans is because of Archie. Interesting. Um, I never really used to pay any attention at all before I met Archie, like at all. So, look, I, I, I'm sort of with you. So, so originally or historically, I would have said that I was aware of its historic importance. I definitely liked the history of it in the early 50s and 60s years and obviously the Ford versus Ferrari story and some iconic, you know, McLaren F1, Porsche 917, like so many iconic cars that have come from Le Mans and how Le Mans has helped build the brand of companies like Porsche, uh, some of the Japanese like Mazda, Toyota that have had success, the McLaren F1 story. Yeah, yeah. So lots of reasons why I like the idea yep. or the title of the race, but... I very rarely watched it. You know, I would kind of watch the highlights or watch the final or, or be aware of who won, but I yeah. wouldn't really watch it. Yeah, yeah. And then I went in 2017 and I'm fairly sure at the top level, which was LMP1 at the time, it was probably only, I think it was Toyota and Porsche were the only two really competitive teams. I'd have to double check no, that. I think or you're right. Check that. Yeah, but I think you're right. Yeah. I think 2016 is the year when Toyota won on the, sorry, lost on the final lap, I think. Right. Um, so yeah, so please fact check me in the comment section below if I'm getting these dates wrong, people. But yeah, so, and not only was it just those two teams, but it was of an era where after lap two, the field spread was 20 or 30 seconds. You just kind of had to sit by and wait for it all to kind of play out. Because yeah. you say it's a 24 it's hour endurance race. race yeah. So somebody overtakes someone on lap 132. Yeah. It's not like, oh my God, it's an overtake for the lead because yeah. you've still got 16 hours to go. Exactly, so, yeah. Anything can happen. And, and so, yeah, it, it was, yeah, not one that I immediately sort of thought, yeah. you know, I can't wait for. And especially, I think Toyota won the last six years or so. They, they've been the, don, the dominant force for five or six years. Yeah, I know, I know that much. And then I think like, it was Porsche before then. And I think all these- Audi had a huge uh, run. I think, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, so- <clears throat> I think, yeah, because of that, I just, I just was never that gassed about watching or attending. Back then as well, mate, you wasn't as, uh, as a Porsche enthusiast as you are now. That's yeah, been fair, good time. point, very and, good point. And Ferrari haven't been in it. Well, okay, so then here we go. Segway. Uh, thank you. Getting good at this, aren't I? <laughs> you are a pro. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we now have this new era of endurance racing with the hypercar class. And we've been talking about it a lot on this podcast and everything that has brought... Or, or that's come with that, including, yes, yeah, some of our favourite manufacturers, but also more recognisable manufacturers. And it's the same thing for Formula One. When you have a brand, a team, a manufacturer that you can support, that you know, or you can drive away that evening, 
it makes your investment in the race so much higher. Yeah, yeah. Win on a Sunday, sell on a Monday. Well, that's exactly the theory, yeah. uh, or at least what Lawrence Stroll is claiming is happening at Aston Martin. <laughs> and so, yeah, so this year... They won know, anything yet? Aston Martin? Yeah. Not no. in Formula One, no. But they're, they're winning strategy. They're, they're competing. <laughs> they're competing, yeah. So, yeah, it's not... Compete on a Sunday... Sell some on a Monday. Sell something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shares mostly. Shares, <laughs> apparently. Or, or here's that he's selling. Anyway, that's a whole other story for a whole other podcast. Um, so yeah, so we, we got Ferrari, Porsche, uh, Toyota still there, Peugeot. Uh, next year we've got Lamborghini, Alpine, BMW. Um, you have uh, smaller teams, but still semi-recognizable in the world of racing, Glickenhaus, yeah, and yeah. Vanderwall and things like that. So, They've done all right, didn't they, this year? Glickenhaus did great, but we're going to yeah. get into that. Um, so yeah, so I, I was immediately excited when that class got announced and of course Ferrari returning to endurance racing I'm like oh, yeah. and I thought okay the, the centenary event of the Le Mans 24 hour that's a race I want to attend it's going to be a big event and then on top of that we've got this new hypercar class and Ferrari and other teams Porsche competing you know at the top level yeah I then went to Spa during the podium tours rally that was my first taster of this new era. And I was like, oh my God, this is even better than I could have expected. Like these cars look amazing. They sound great. It's so much fun to be here being like, oh, go Ferrari. Like, you know, it's like, it's, I'm invested. And I was like, okay, well, no, no matter what now, I've got to get to that Le Mans event somehow. And then huge thanks to Peugeot. They came through with the invite of all invites. Come for a VIP extravaganza. Join us for all three days. I actually was there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Wow. In our hospitality, we'll be up in a mansion, shuttle you back and forth, give you a car to drive down. Like, oh, I was like, hello. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, so went off with like all the expectations. But I'll be honest, the expectations for just a great event, I wasn't necessarily going being like, oh, it's going to be a, like a mega race. It's going to be interesting, but I just, I know it's going to be an exciting event. Going into it, I believe most of us thought Toyota would still kind of romp away with the victory. Right. Because so far this year, and again, please fact check me audience, you're so good at doing that. Ferrari have kind of qualified at the front. They've had great single lap pace and then the race kind of faded away and Toyota have just romped away with it. That's the like F1 spot. car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, Paul and I just did an F1 podcast talking a lot about like the kind of, well, how, why Ferrari nail the World Endurance Championship and absolutely fail at Formula One these days. So. I can t I can tell you there's there's always a theory with Ferrari as well. While they're making good road cars, the Formula One teams and the endurance teams are never any good. But when they make crap road cars, then the F one T's and all the endurance teams are flying. Well, but vice versa. So I think don't put endurance with that, right? Because because endurance are the road cars essentially. Like they've been in the GT class for so long, it's just been four eight eight elements. Challenge, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so they they've been variations of yeah. the road cars. Uh, it's just yeah, you're right. Road cars do well. Formula One team sucks. Yeah. <laughs> is is the Ferrari trend? Yeah. But somehow in and amongst that, nope, they deliver a really quick hypercar for the endurance championship. But yeah, so we all went. I think going okay, fine. You know, Toyota are gonna. It's, it, it's going to probably still be a bit of a walkover. The race began, Ferrari one and two. Yeah. And what you missed, mate, is I, I'm not even joking, for 16 hours, it was flat out. I don't know what happened, but the drivers and the teams acted like it was a 24-hour sprint race. Like lap 30, you've got Ferrari teammates forcing each other into the wall. You've got drivers overtaking on the grass, people plowing into each other. Like they were racing so hard. I actually don't remember a race I've enjoyed watching that much for years, like ge genuinely, because even Formula One at its best, a highly entertaining race, firstly has its peaks and troughs because of strategy, but it's an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. Mate, this was flat out. Like, like, you have really missed out on not watching this because this would have been right up your street, mate. Like, because not only were they sprint-style racing from the flag dropping, but there was so much intrigue because immediately people split strategies and your head just goes. Yeah, like, yeah. You're like, well, I have no clue now how this is going to shuffle yeah, out. Like, yeah. who's in the lead? Who's actually in the lead? Who's got more pit stops? Yeah. You can fuel for different... like. So confusing. Yeah. Um, but as a spectacle, it was mind-blogging. 
mind boggling because on top of that, I, I was there going, okay, I've got Ferrari, obviously super excited at the front. That's my team. Like I want them to do well. Porsche. Yeah. Okay. We're here. And then Peugeot, I was with them and they're the kind of underdogs. It's so much fun when you're supporting an underdog. Well, they were winning at one point. No? That's what I mean. And that's the best in motor racing. I had a few comments from people being like, Oh, why are you going with Peugeot? Like, you could have gone with a better team. Firstly, I'm going with whoever invites me. Like, can I tell you, by the way, Peugeot are one of the biggest manufacturers in the world of cars. Well, they're firstly, huge PSA group. Huge. Aren't they part of Stellantis now? Uh, yeah, they're part of Stellantis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can't believe them. I mean, they own Vauxhall. I massive. Mean, huge, mate. But also, like, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, I've been invited to Le Mans by Peugeot. No, thank you. Like, yeah. unless I get invited by Ferrari or Porsche. I'm not going. Uh, Which so is that, what I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> that invite came in. I was like, I'm on my I'm way. I'm coming. But also, as I said, like, I've, I've experienced it before with various levels of motorsport. If you go with an underdog team and they start doing well, it is way more exciting than yeah. going with Toyota and just putting your head in your hands when they start losing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're with, with Peugeot. And uh, as you say, like, even at moments during the race, they started leading. Mm. Like, we had these crazy parts with rain and then different strategies. And then there were people crashing out. And that's what's amazing because it's such a long race drivers just lose attention or you know their focus and you genuinely towards the very end when you had after 18 19 20 hours toyota and ferrari separated by less than 15 seconds yeah. on track the Detroit driver locks up his rears and yeah. goes off and basically ends the race and yeah. like as far as i know that was driver fault it could have yeah. been a mechanical issue but yeah it it was as i say one of the best races I've ever had the opportunity to watch live or on TV. Yeah. What I like about Le Mans as well is, is one, the different level of drivers because of the different categories. I mean, that's why there's so many crashes, mate, because obviously you, you've got gentleman drivers in there as well, right? Less than before, but yeah. Yeah. So you get a gentleman driver that, that could be someone like me and you, essentially. I mean, the gentleman drivers are essentially paying for their seat. They're not pros. They're ams. Co- Correct. Amateurs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they're classed differently, but they're on track at the same time as Antonio Giovinazzi, ex-Formula 1 driver, driving the works Ferrari hypercar. Correct. So that, that's how the crashes happen. But it's unfair. I, mean, like, I mean, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's pretty, well, and we should get into the crashes, actually. But to call them like, they are still really good drivers to see people, and they're not rocking up for like the first time and going, no, oh, I'll pay 450 grand just to do Le Mans this weekend. Like, like it's two million quid. Like yeah, I mean, they do know what they're doing. Yeah. Like, like, like they're, they're not literally... It's always the first time for everyone though, mate. Yeah, uh, first time at Le Mans for sure. Yeah. But but we shouldn't... It's not literally like these guys are clueless idiots on the track. It's just the fact that, as you say, you've got such differing levels of speed yeah. and then experience. The closing speeds, of course. Oh yeah, my yeah, God. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so I think a lot of the pro drivers end up in big bashes. And as I say, yeah. like even... So many of the top tier drivers in the hypercar class that have to be super pro made big mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Made big, big mistakes. But that, all, that happens at all levels of sport, though, don't they? They do make mistakes. Just pros in general make less mistakes. And, I get, they're, and they're right on the edge. According to this year's Le Mans, they didn't. But yeah, I agree. Like, you know they were making mean? more mistakes than yeah, anyone. Yeah. But you're so right. Um, and that insanity of the difference in classes from, yeah, what are the, G, or what, the outgoing LM... Oh, I forget all the bloody names. LM, GTEP, AM, Pro, but basically the 48s and the Vantages and the They're all going, aren't they? So, yeah, they're all going. They were getting yeah. GT3 class next yeah. year. But from them up to the hypercar class, you know, especially in the high speed stuff, it's insane. But if you get a hypercar car, car closing on a gaggle of GT cars who are all racing for them, it's mad to yeah, watch. Yeah, yeah. LMP2 is slightly pointless this year. They're well, going as well. Not yeah, well, they're normal. similar speed to the hypercars, right? And I, I, I believe they've actually been turned down because if you if you turn an LM, LMP2 car down, it does similar lap... If you turn it up, sorry, it does similar lap times to the hypercar. Maybe, because the hypercars are, I think, five or so seconds slower than the old LMP1 Correct. class. Correct, yeah. So they've turned the... they backed the LMP2 car de- off because it, oh. it's just as fast. Yeah, potentially. So, but they, they just felt like they got in the way. <laughs> I'll be honest, they got yeah. very little coverage and just seemed like they were getting in the way. But I think that's because this hypercar class was so exhilarating. Like, yeah. like honestly, I, I couldn't believe how hard and how close these guys were racing for 
23 hours. I think Ferrari do that a bit as well, by the way. Whenever they enter a race, there's always more excitement because of the heritage of the brand. But, you know, I think whenever whenever they enter a race, you know, like how many times has it been said over the years, like you take Ferrari out of F1, F1 isn't really anything without Ferrari. But is Ferrari I mean? anything without F1? Those brands are so intrinsically linked. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, who knows? We're never going to know that because yeah. they're probably never going to leave, and it's never going to be a problem. But there's always like, you know, from what I saw from the TV, that all the Ferrari fans and the flags that you see over the weekend. I mean, they've not been there for fifty years. Well, this is the whole thing, right? So I think you're right that the interest level spiked, of course, you know, yeah. like, because you know if, if Ferrari get involved, it insinuates like this is serious now this yeah. is proper top level racing a ferrari involved yeah. and and the question is or the question was did ferrari come back with that sole goal of like we're winning le mans like are uh, we are building a car to win le mans because you say they've been there or thereabouts this year in the other races within that championship bedding in but hadn't really delivered it's almost as if they have this sole focus and it's an incredible story and obviously since then, like Ford in the sixties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's similar that thing. similar. We are coming, winning. We are coming to win. Yeah. Like, and that is our sole focus. And then, obviously, they can run right with that story. You know, ask a child to paint a race car or a car, and yeah, it's, it's yeah. red. And you know, because yeah, Ferrari is synonymous with racing, and everyone wants Ferrari to win. You know, you were seeing there, no matter which team you were supporting. I mean, I guess even the Toyota people. Well, they might have a bit of pill to swallow, but. I think everyone wanted to hit, see that story yeah. for Giovinazzi, you know, XF1 driver for Collado, who's been in that Ferrari family for a long time. For like, it was a great, great story for the centenary, for Le Mans, for the world of racing. Yeah. Um, but as I say, it was the competitiveness throughout the field. Yeah. Competitiveness that didn't come from Porsche. <laughs> Which is, uh, we spoke briefly about this on WhatsApp. I mean, that is so unusual because Porsche are normally the best at endurance races. Whenever you look at their, you know, like when they do the Nürburg, what the, the Spa, they're always there or thereabouts. In just the last couple of years, they've just fallen off. And one of my favourite tin top drivers, Kevin Estra, who I always look for because I, I just think he's, as a, for a tin top driver, he's incredible. And I always look for him, you know, when he's up, when he's racing. I mean, they were just nowhere. I think the thing which is bizarre is, as far as I know, Porsche have competed in Le Mans for every year that Porsche have existed. Right. Or, or, or sorry, since the... Actually, that's a lie, because they first car came out 1953? No, for 75 years. Anyway, whatever the 356 was, the 356, and, and then it was, I think it was three or four years later that they 75 entered. 75 years is uh, 48, isn't it? Uh, yeah, and then they entered in fifty one with the th with in Le Mans. So okay, so since fifty one, they competed in every single year since since then. Um, so they've always been there or thereabouts. And you say like it's a big part of their brand and yeah. their statement and what they say about GT cars and everything like that. Yeah. And this hypercar class, they seem to have just gone a little bit wrong. They've built a car which they're selling on. Other teams can buy and have bought over an IMSA as well, and obviously for the World Endurance Championship. But the factory cars being run by Penske, I'll be honest, just, they haven't looked competitive, I don't think, all year mm. in the championship. And then they turn up to Le Mans, and I'll be honest, at no point in that race did they really look like they were troubling the, the podium positions. The quick boys, yeah. The quick boys. You know, Cadillac are really... I mean, look at Cadillac with the V-Series after our Escalade experience. Go on. <laughs> um, but the Cadillacs looked and sounded amazing. And Porsche were like sort of half arsedly fighting them. And there were some great shots of the Porsches on track, but I never at one point sat there going like, come on Porsche. Yeah. The whole time I was like, come on Ferrari or yeah, like, come yeah. on Peugeot. But yeah, yeah. I never felt like I'd get that excited about Porsche. And even in the GT class, like the old 911 RSRs weren't, I mean, the Iron Dames were doing well, but they didn't really feel the really Corvette, in Corvette, the, one, Corvette, then Aston, and then 911 was in, in, in third place. So yeah, a bit weird that because yeah. I would have said Porsche's, heritage history racing um program is way more focused on endurance and le mans than ferrari it's yeah of course so ferrari hadn't done it for 50 years yeah. there was no great expectation of ferrari returning to endurance racing they had to win but at the centenary event if any brand was going to be wholly focused on winning that race i would have thought it was porsche and it just felt like they fell really short yeah i mean i think ferrari won 
they won, didn't they win the 24 hour Nürburgring draw in the 296 I think they won Maybe. that as well recently the 296 GT3 or whatever yeah the, the 296 GT3 oh, wow. I think that was yeah. a few weeks ago potentially so um, fact check me but I yeah. am f- I've, I've, I'm sure I saw that okay as in um, so that would be another hint that they're going endurance and normally like you know Porsche are dominant and, and stuff like that and uh, Mercedes have been very good at endurance and that sort of in, in the eight, like like a black series they've been very good at that over recent years so I think it's I think it's going to be fascinating to see because you know we're all reveling in this moment and it's great and it's exciting that Ferrari have finally won something big that we can all get excited about and I'm absolutely certain and we'll talk about it in two seconds that we're going to be getting some 499p edition somethings and, oh, mate. and Le Mans oh. liveries and badges and you know 100% all of our coming. cars have just gone up 25 grand yeah, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we'll get we'll come back to that in two seconds yeah. but yeah i think porsche probably need to pull their finger out a bit because it, i say it was a weak showing and uh, you know i really because it's their 75th anniversary and there's all this noise going on I was like, I, I'd be a board level. How have they kind of let this happen? Like, mm. and next year we've got Lamborghini, Alpine, BMW, like loads more manufacturers yeah. entering the fray. If Porsche start losing to them as well, you're like, well, come on, what does that say Going about on, yeah. yeah, your overall mission statement and who you are and what you do? If you're then failing at the kind of one race that is so tied to your history yeah. and heritage. Yeah. But, uh, let's go back to that. So Ferrari, now we know they've, they've done this victory. They're going to milk it because, you know, not much success happening in Formula One these days. And well, not much success anywhere else. So apart from, to, the, apart from the fact they sell all their cars. Yeah. Okay. Road cars. Great success. <laughs> so how much more success do you want than that? Do we expect, and what will it look like? Some kind of what? Le Mans livery. Are they going to put the badge back? Are we going to remember the F1 world titles badge? Are we going to get a Le Mans 2023 centenary badge in all n- the models for the next 12 months or will there be a special run out like they're gonna do so- it's ferrari they'll do something I and mean, they yeah, probably already have something yeah. waiting in the wings yeah yeah for a long time ago yeah what could we see what what what, what would you well uh, but i wouldn't mind betting there will be some sort of limited edition car coming out of it for sure yeah one of 499 they already know they're gonna give them to they've already sold but they'll They'll make something because that's another 20 million or 50 million or however many hundreds of millions they can make out of that. It'll be based on a V12 car or car they've already got. And uh, they'll they'll, uh, they'll basically just wave the flag and done it, haven't they? Yeah, In and I'll jackpot. go, I'll have that one. Yeah, uh, done it, haven't they? But so for I was there. I I lived and breathed the moment. I got way too overcarried away. I sung Italian songs the whole way home to the Euro Tunnel. Like you know, I was like, oh my yeah. God, I love Ferrari, the best of them. I want ten more. But as someone who was back here in the UK, not necessarily that interested, thinking that Le Mans would follow the same sort of protocols. But then seeing Ferrari one, like, how does that sit for you as a Ferrari fan, owner, customer? Like, are you like, oh? Oh, great. Like, does that have any significance to you? Does that change or make you proud or get you excited about the future? Or is it just like, well, cool, like they won? I couldn't care less. Really? I could not care less. I I, I, I don't know how many Ferraris I've had over the years. I've been lucky enough to have all the ones that I want. And I still keep buying them. Mm. I couldn't, uh, unless, unless the product fails or it's, you know, it then becomes not good anymore in terms of it breaks or, um, uh, you know, it's just not a good product anymore, I'll stop buying it. But I I, 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 could, I mean, the, the racing heritage is cool, obviously, um, but I never really started liking Ferrari because of the racing heritage. I started liking them because I liked this red car when I was a kid. So I think we told that story before and how we both liked it. But... Um, yeah it's just you know it's 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 the pinnacle of car ownership in my opinion it's it's the glamour brand and if you can have the best why not so if they won the f1 world championship yeah would that make you feel any different i'd be fuming because i want lewis to win it again (laughs) oh so there's not an element of ferrari pride i'm just talking about in general like you know, in a ve- like, it doesn't matter who the drivers are. This could be in five years' time, ten years' time, six years ago. 
it, it, does it play any more of a role in your life if Ferrari went on a dominant run or won the world championship? There's not part of you I as care about a, the car. I, ca- I literally care about the car. I'm so not, even a Formula One dominant era wouldn't make you feel any more proud or excited about the brand or anything? No, because I've been buying them for 12 years now. Mm. Have they won Formula One in that time? No. Well, there you go then. Uh, hey, look, I, I get it. I'm already it. proud. The I'm bra- already proud I've yeah. got one. Yeah. I'm, I, 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 I'm proud of myself that I've been able to buy a few. So the That's brand stands alone from the racing, which I think we've known for a while, whilst it built itself on racing. Yeah. And as did Porsche and Aston Martin in some yeah. ways and Jaguar, like built themselves on racing, but now completely stands alone. And of course, there'll be so many other owners and customers like you who have no idea that Ferrari won Le Mans at the weekend. I don't really care. Well, they'll see an article and be like, mm, cool, I got one of those. No, like, I would definitely be aware that they'd won it, obviously, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't care less. And actually, while you're talking about Porsche, while you bring Porsche in, uh, 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 this is going to sound absolutely ridiculous coming out of my mouth like most things I associate motorsport sport more with Porsche than I do with Ferrari so the fact that Porsche did so badly and are doing so badly does that diminish your view of Porsche at all no not not one iota because the the, the their GT product cars are just about the best cars on the market for the money I mean pound for pound they're they're, they're incre- they've always down the years they've always punched above their weight they've always been the the every man on the streets sports car essentially so ferrari's not ferrari's seen a little bit different mm, like mm. in you know the the sort of customer that goes into ferrari and that's why it's a luxury people, item like, isn't it yeah that's why people some people prefer lambo because they don't like the the stigma that's attached to a Ferrari or Ferrari customer. I don't happen to like the stigma that's attached to a Lambo or a Lambo customer, but everyone's different in the way they perform. And then some people don't like either of them two brands and they go and buy a McLaren and then they get recaptured very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not start that yeah. conversation again. Uh, I, but this is okay. So I find this fascinating, right? Because I don't think you're alone. As I say, these brands now have definitely separated themselves. Their road car products, they've separated from their racing program. Um, but, but within that, why are they then racing? Because, of course, you can say technical development, R&D, pushing products forward because it's part of their DNA. That's exactly why. But a huge part of it is why is marketing. Like a lot of the reasons yeah. why a lot of these brands race is purely for marketing. Like, yeah. and uh, you said it already, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. And yeah. that's the big, big avenue that Lance, L- Lawrence Stroll, not Lawrence Stroll, Lawrence Stroll is going down with Aston Martin. But maybe it's that if you win a big event, so maybe today lots of non-Ferrari customers, but wealthy individuals are calling up their Ferrari dealers saying, oh, I'm... I want to buy an F8 Tributo now because well, I want to buy a 296. Sorry, sir, because we ain't I, got one. Well, yes. <laughs> sorry, sir, we ain't got one. Clever from Ferrari, that. Yeah. I want a Rolex Daytona Le Mans edition <laughs> and a 296 <laughs> in 499B livery. Can't have either, sir. Yeah. Um, but, but so maybe it's good at raising awareness for the bystander. Yeah. But those who are already fans of the brand or the product or already own it, maybe it doesn't have the same effect. I... It's really hard because I'm someone who loves the racing heritage and the story. And, and there is a part of me that looks at Porsche being like, it's a bit embarrassing, guys. Like, what's going on? Like, that does diminish a little bit a part of at least Porsche's motorsport brand at the moment, I think. Whereas Ferrari, I'm like, well, proving the pudding for her, you can do it right. You can still win stuff. You can turn up and win. And all of that emotion and success and history and everything is re enlightened inside of me. But you're right. I mean, I've I bought and will buy and want to own Ferraris aside from their success. Of course. You know, they haven't had any for yeah. a while. Um, and both of them brands, no matter what they're doing on, on the racetrack, they both make such incredible products mm. now for their customer. I mean, it is amazing. And technology is a, 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 has a big say in that. Like, I, I truly believe that they do do motorsport. One marketing's a big thing and it's and it's very good advertising as well like when you think like the mcdonald's and coca-cola have to advertise anymore probably not but they still do because it keeps it fresh in people's mind and that's probably a really big reason why they continue to be at the forefront of motorsport because it keeps it 
fresh in people's mind. If they win, it's good. Even if they don't win, people still talk about it. Oh, yeah. But, and Ferrari will will milk this Le Mans victory for 12 months. But they will, just like Porsche have in the past. I don't... This is snobbish. I don't understand, apart from the R&D, I don't understand why Toyota do it. Because apart from the, the, the GR department, which make the good the the Yaris obviously which they had to make for homologation and then that car didn't end up being built anyway they made a load of cars that that didn't make them any money apparently um and the the little GR86 thing and the Supra essentially does that really help them sell cars being I put my hand up like a in a school Paul and I had this big conversation leaving Le Mans. Did you? Because <laughs> over and above that, I don't think we saw at any point over the weekend Toyota fans. Mm. We saw Alpine fans. They're not even competing in hypercar class yet. Yeah. You know, of course, Ferrari, Peugeot, like, and, and groups of cars, convoys. It's not like we saw like a GR Yaris owners club driving in. But, 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 but. I think we underestimate the power, the appeal, and the brand value of GR and Toyota in Japan. So, firstly, I went to Toyota World during Drive the World. GR, back then, in 2019, before it became its powerhouse that it is, was already way more of an AMG RS M than we ever expected. In Japan? In Japan, you right. can get GR lines on everything. Right, okay. There's GR line Prius, which had like crazy wheels and it was loaded suspension yeah. and wings, like every single car you could have GR parts okay. on. The GR brand is now filtered across yeah here to Europe with these special editions to try and really solidify this is what GR is. But I think within Toyota and maybe other parts of the Asian market, that that was already a power play. So I think that's why they've taken GR, Gazoo Racing, to play off. Gazoo Racing, the people who run the Le Mans program, look how successful that is. That's why GR is the badge we want to go for right. and the department that are going to be. So so they're still building their brand, whereas Porsche and Ferrari are already there, basically. That's I what, think they're building their brand in Europe. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. They've yeah. Done it in, but, but obviously in, in Japan, Ferrari and Porsche will already be prominent there because they're worldwide brands, whereas... Obviously, GR are prominent in Japan, but they need to they need to get it over here. Well, I so, think it's the famous story with the McLaren F1, which this had been told to me by various people, but might be diluted. So again, help me out, audience. I believe that McLaren F1 was so popular in Japan because, obviously, it had a big Japanese sponsor when it won its first victory, and there was right. an association with Japan and that car. That's why so many sort of went over to Japan. Um... And so I think, yeah, Toyota for sure, they've got their own strategy, which maybe we don't see enough yeah. of. Like, so why most of their drivers are Japanese. And, you know, there's a lot of that sort of home Target heritage. Target different market, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But over and above that, Toyota have been very vocal for a long time now that they are not jumping on this big EV bandwagon. They've come out and said a lot of times that they're pushing really hard with hydrogen. Yeah. And we know there's going to be hydrogen tech from next year onwards, like they're yeah. pushing big in that direction. There was actually a demonstration lap of a hydrogen sort of LM car right. um, before the start of the race, uh, spewing out uh, vapours, water vapours out the yeah, back. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so I think I could see how Toyota would say that they're genuinely using motorsport as a test bed for smaller, more efficient engines, more uh strong engines engines that can last longer you can do 24 hours at this pace yeah. so therefore our engines will do 200,000 miles on the road without a blink you know like, i think they're all doing that mate yeah but i th i think that's part of toyota's brand identity a lot more efficiency longevity yeah. uh quality of parts blah blah over and above Ferrari, which is like speed yeah yeah so i think that's why toyota have been doing it so long i, I could be wrong and it's a, but They'll we don't have a different strategy on how they how they box it up essentially yeah ferrari will sell it on speed and and Toyota will make it reliability and robust. And all it, that. Ex yeah, I, yeah. I would assume, I would assume. Any Japanese listeners, let us know in the comment section below if you see a lot of, you know, GR and Le Mans marketing yeah. in Japan. I'm, I'm sure you do. It obviously works, mate, because they wouldn't do it for, you know. They're not spending money for the sake of it. They're not, they are 
doing it to get their brand out there and, and it's the age old thing why they all do them Nürburgring times yeah it's of marketing. course it's all it's marketing all, it's all, um, yeah. and look it, it's work because here we are uh, talking about the race uh, yeah. after it's taken place and, and what a race it was but it was surrounded by a lot of other excitement and activities so a few sort of Car launches, I suppose, or, or car reveals, maybe. Um, that Alp- I saw that Alpine hatchback. I wonder if we'd. Sorry, Go I on. wonder if we'd we would have spoken about it at this depth and length, though, if you hadn't have been, because we've been doing this podcast five or six years now, five years probably. And this is the first year we really ever spoke about Le Mans because. I, I would say yes, because I was always going to watch the race right. because of how excited I was about this class. I think this new era... Why was you excited? Because of the the company or the teams taking part. Ferrari. I say Ferrari, Porsche, Peugeot, brands that I recognise, could get behind, could understand, could support. The relative closeness in racing that we have seen at the races so far. Yeah. The taste I got at Spa, the drivers I recognised, the fact that it was a centenary. So I was always going to watch. Okay. And I think if you sat down and watched the first hour, you were going nowhere. Right. Because it was so absolutely like, oh my God, where in every other year when I've given it a shot, as I say, 10 laps in, you're like, okay, oh. Yeah. I'll just tune at the end and see what happened. Yeah, fair. Where this, you know, I, I kind of didn't want to go to sleep because I was like, anything could happen anything overnight. Happen, but... Yeah. I was like, well, we have to. And also, Paul wants to go home and we were showing the car. So, <laughs> um, But yeah, no, no, you're, you're right. But but so I, I asked, we, there was a Q&A with the Peugeot drivers and it was a, probably a fairly obvious question to ask. But I said to them, I was like, does, I'm sure you would all have said, we want to win Le Mans as a race to win. It's a very important thing for you as a career and blah, blah. Of course. But having these manufacturers involved, does it, increase your excitement or desire to be in this form of racing because all of them do everything else i mean Dereste's on tv most of the time um uh, jean eric verne is racing formula e and in and out of good revival so they always yeah. different categories yeah. but was there more of a motivation to get into a hypercar and they said yes they said the desire across the board from sports car races to get a hypercar seat is through the roof right and with all these new teams coming next year, the amount of drivers like really trying to position themselves for factory race seats because it carries more weight. Mm. You know, Giovinazzi is the prime story, you know, theoretically booted out of F1 and in inverted commas. Um, no, no space at the top table, say, even though he's part of the Ferrari program. Ferrari kind of scoop him up and say, come on, mate, you know, we'll, we'll let you have a drive in the, in the endurance car. Like that's your sort of, you know, consolation prize. And he's quick enough. Sorry? And he's quick enough. He, and he's what? And he's quick enough. Quick enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he's a proper driver. He's That's what I'm saying. Yeah, legit. they wouldn't give him the seat if he's not quick enough. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. He's, he's serious, but he does you yeah, know yeah. Four, falls out from F1, and uh, and that it, it, if if he had just ended up in an LMP2 car or a GT car and won the class, it wouldn't have the same headlines, the same emotion, the same meaning as he did winning for for Ferrari as a factory driver at Le Mans overall victory. That's the big, hells yeah. There are plenty of F1 drivers who have left Formula One and gone on to win in Le Mans in various categories. But it's different, I think, now with this hypercar class. I yeah. think it's very different. Yeah, but I think if you're if you're a factory driver at any level, you're unbelievable. No, but mate, tell me who were the drivers for the Ferrari GTE AF Corsa victory in 2019 no when they idea. did the P- I don't exactly. follow it. But I don't follow it. No, but I think you you don't follow now, but the overall winners of Le Mans have far more uh, gravitas yeah. than the class winners. Yeah. And there's always one or two drivers within that. So, you know, Andy Wallace when he won. I mean, he had teammates and I don't know who they are. Martin Brundle and Derek Bell. Like, they always have teammates. There's always yeah, one. Yeah. And Giovinazzi, unfortunately, is getting that. You know, Paul Collado and Guidi, who are yeah, you yeah. Know, his teammates. The, he'll be remembered as the Giovinazzi one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but that's the thing. Is, you know, they, they carry that gravitas where you might hear that, oh, that great year where Aston Martin and Corvette were racing to the, to the checkered flag. Like, it was amazing. Who were the drivers? Do we all remember? Of course, people will. Yeah. But I think overall winners have a yeah a longer shelf life. Yeah, yeah. Um, in in the world of racing, uh, but yeah. So to go back, so I saw that I saw the little Alpine electric hatch thing, which uh, looked really cool. Definitely more concept car than than I realised, uh, and it's big. It's the one that's based on the Renault Five. 
It, it oh, is, is quite, it? Yeah, it sort of felt... It was next to an A110, so it's hard to tell, and it was on a stand. Did it, feel, did it look like a hatchback, or it looked like a... More Ionic 5 looking and feeling. I would love Not to look at big. the dimensions. As I say, it was next to an A110, and it was on a stand. Wow. So it was really hard to judge, but it was definitely big. Definitely bigger than I realised. It's not 500, Fiat 500E size, I don't think. So the new Ford Mustang Dark Horse finished. Remember, we saw it in uh, the LA Auto Show. We did see that, yeah. We, we saw it finished, got inside, sat in it, popped open the, the bonnet and everything. One thing which is really cool, drift mode is back in a Ford product. So after the Focus RS... They have engineered it into a hydraulic handbrake. Oh, wow. Crash. So literally. <laughs> how that's going to be insurable, I have no just idea. Just have your mate sitting next to you go, what's this done? Yeah. So you literally. can literally just be like, rrr, rrr, rrr. So that was Flipping super cool. Um, and then, of course, the big car, which we should probably touch on, that was there hiding at the Porsche stand, the Mission X. Is that that new electric thing? So, yeah. So this obviously got unveiled at, Porsche's big 75th anniversary birthday what just shame. before Le Mans. What a shame. Oh, yeah. They're making such a fuss over a big electric car. Oh, oh don't be like that. Oh, yeah, well, no. I mean, you're at a prestige petrol event. No, no, no. It's happened before the event, mate. This was launched at a completely separate event, Porsche 70th. It was just happened to be there lurking in the background. You couldn't go and see it. The public couldn't see it. It was invite only. So forget, it's not tied to Le Mans. It's nothing right, to do with okay. Le Mans. It just happened last really week. really about to go in on one then. We haven't spoken about it. <laughs> we haven't spoken about it. So we spoke a lot about the anticipation for this event, all the rumours. We were convinced it was going to be the 911 ST. Yeah. And then people started saying, no, no, ST's been held back for Pebble Beach, Monterey Spike on Spike's Car Radio. Ah. Our good friends. Uh, he was saying that he's heard as well that's been held back for, for Car Week. So it was like, what's going to be unveiled? And then we finally we finally see this this Mission X concept, which fundamentally is the successor for the 918. It's the next hypercar. They, I don't think they said it as much. They definitely insinuated hardcore that this is what it is. I don't think we got any sort of production timeline. We didn't get a kind of year... It looked production car ready. My God, this looked nearly like a finished article to me. They're normally about every 10 years. So, it, I mean, we're 2023 now, so it'd be 20... I mean, be next year-ish. We should see a production version probably yeah, next year. they're normally think. every 10 years, aren't they? Yeah. So, what were your thoughts? Because obviously we were hyped and unexpected and it, the car sort of broke the internet for, for half a minute. When you saw it, when we first learned about it, what was your gut initial reaction? I paid it hardly any attention. Really? Hardly any, yeah. Because, one, I'm not going to get one. As in, it's not... As You're in, not going to get an allocation. Uh, no chance. Yeah. I wouldn't want it anyway because it's electric. It just didn't... It doesn't appeal to me uh, at all. Okay, let's deep dive on this. And I'm going to try not to get angry and frustrated. Uh, wish me luck, people. So... <laughs> Okay, I understand the not paying attention because you're not going to get one. Like, I'm sort of with you. Like, not even, even that. I just don't... It doesn't doesn't appeal to me. And it's in concept form. Fine. Yeah. So, were you disheartened because of all of our expectations when I went, this is what they've launched? Because we were talking about it in a WhatsApp group. When I went, this is the car, were you like, ugh? Like, were you hoping it was going to be the ST? I don't think or? I replied, did I? Did I even reply? Uh, this Paul sure, normally goes, sure bing, 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 yeah, bing, yeah, bing. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I probably said anything. Yeah, you probably didn't say anything. No, because it's like... Okay, because I, I will admit I was a bit like, oh, okay, <laughs> as in like, as in like, oh, it's just a concept type thing. Oh, right. I know it's not just a concept because yeah, it, yeah. it will lead to that production car. It looks so production ready, but I, I was disappointed that it wasn't more just because we had stupidly built up our own expectations. Yeah, maybe, maybe this is why Porsche ain't doing very good now because the cars are trying to make electric cars. We're gonna be an electric car maker. Actually, okay, so this is why I'm gonna fight you. We've known this. Porsche have come out and said they by have. 2025, 2028, like 75% of their fleet will be electric. This yeah. is the direction they're going in. And most of the time that makes sense. And the Taycan, brilliant. We love it. We talk Lovely about car. how much we absolutely adore it. But, uh, electric Cayman, we are super excited for. Loads of potential. Really fun, really cool. A little electric and a sports McCann. car. Electric Macan, yeah. brilliant. As long as it does the range. As long as it does the perfect. range. 100%. Yeah. Porsche, we love apart from their racing history, apparently, for their development, their road cars, all these different things. And we have to believe development of batteries, where we're getting solid state batteries, etc., so that they will improve, they will become lighter, and maybe they're on the cusp of that Porsche. Maybe they've got lithium sodium, the sodium ion. Oh, I get so confused with battery technology. Maybe they've got the next generation of battery technology yeah. ready to be lighter, to go further, etc. Yeah. To immediately just go, don't like it, it's electric. Is that not a bit naive, potentially? No. Because not, not as far as I'm concerned, because I've not really driven an electric car yet, which I think oh, I'd love to own this. That's what I can. 
Yeah, but but I would <laughs> but but if I'd love to, I'd bought one now. So if I if, if you had a gun to my I've said this this is what I've said. If you had a gun to my head today and you said you have to go and buy an electric car, I would go and buy a Taycan. But no one's got a gun to my head. I can still buy a combustion car. That's what I will continue to do. But you're not buying a Taycan because of the lifestyle, because of the infrastructure, what it means to run an electric car, not because of the car itself, but because of everything around it. Yeah, but it's the... Um, if I had a choice still at the moment, and I do have a choice, I would still buy a combustion car over an electric car, even if it was perfect. For sure. Okay, and fine. you probably would as well. Uh, yes, but I'm, I've been speaking about it a lot recently. I'm very keen to run an electric car at the moment. I yeah. am very keen, but amongst other cars. Uh, but, okay, I, I would be to, the same. Yeah, okay. So yeah. I would be exactly the same. So... The reason that I am not immediately knocking oh, oh, electric, firstly, Porsche are trying to say that they they want a one to one rate ratio, something like fifteen hundred kilos to fifteen hundred horsepower. Yeah, for the road. For the road. Yeah. You know. Crash. But any hype. I mean, freaking SF ninety is a thousand horsepower, so you know they yeah. got to, they got to do something. Ain't one silly. to one though. It's no, nearly no. one to two. No fair. Um, it's incredible. One to one, which does suggest next generation of battery technology. Yeah. So that could be a range of five hundred miles. Rate. Yeah, yeah, re, 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 exactly. Rim up and, and helping with the batteries and yeah. the development. So, you know, we could see five hundred miles, fifteen hundred horsepower, a car that weighs fifteen hundred kilos. Like yeah. that's a good weight. That's a good weight, fifteen hundred kilos for a hypercar. It's very good weight. Yeah. It's so what most supercars are. So I think there is potential. We know all the benefits driving dynamically that electric can deliver in terms of immediate throttle response, talkiness, pace off the line. They can engineer in some sound in some shape or form to make that exhilarate. Like I am all with the hope and the excitement and the like, if someone's going to get it right, I feel like Porsche are in a good place to nail the electric hypercar type thing. All right, you've convinced me. I'll have one. How much is it? It will be around two and a half mil, I reckon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't blame you. I say like the whole, you know, it's like sport classic. You yeah. know, I love the sport. I'm never going to get a sport classic, so I can't allow myself to fully love it. Like, yeah. um, so I, I, do, I definitely appreciate where you're coming from in that sense. And that is our rhetoric on this podcast. If you haven't listened to us before, when it comes to Koenigseggs, Hennessy's, Pagani's, even Bugatti's, we don't tend to give it a whole chunk of time because for us, this is us having a conversation between two friends. They're not cars that we're ever really getting excited well, it's about. It's not relatable, yeah. It's not relatable for us, for our, yeah. our experience, you know. We can get excited on the internet and everything, but it's not relate. And it actually, if I... You had- know what's way more relatable? £350,000 pistas. <laughs> <laughs> but it is more relatable. I mean, how many people watch us that... that- that no, drive no, great big hypercars. Yeah, but how many people watch us with <laughs> 500 pound puntos? As well? <laughs> but um, if I had two and a half million quid to spend on a car today, now, today, on a car, you're, going, you're, 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 you're not going to believe what I'm going to say. I'd probably buy the Valkyrie at the moment. Oh, you're not going to go one mile. But they that don't, don't car work, apparently. is insane yeah but apparently they don't work i literally i've spoken to now four owners that aston martin have been out to see them six times to replace parts to change things to oh well, i sit there no good then i'll just stick with a laugh couldn't get a laugh to work well you could have could well, you can't now they can't now what the coops and the lawn to it no yeah, they can't be gone you want me to check <laughs> they can't be you want me to check more than two and a half mil now are they Oh, I'll stick Ferrari, with me 918 then. Ferrari for sale. I'll, I'll stick with the 918, mate. I mean, I have some change. James Edition is always buy another house. Uh, price on request is a nice coupe for four million. No uh, yeah, in, dollars in Canada. Four million dollars in Canada. Uh, price on request in Spain. Price on request in Spain. Wow. Three and a half million dollars US dollars in. Oh, Dubai. they've gone. Four millions in Florida. Those wow. Are almost all coupes. Wow, they've really... I mean, could that weren't long ago, mate. But also, mate, I think one thing which we haven't spoken about and haven't realised and we can do another episode on... Um, oh, Virgin Media just texted me saying, we've got an outage in your era. How predictable. <laughs> Damn you, Virgin Media. Um, the UK car market at that level is dead compared to Europe, US. We are... Our market is dead because of the... Brexit and import export and right hand drive and everything like that. We are so far behind values of 
so many cars around the world. So well, I can you, for that. you might be able to find a UK two and a half million pound laugh potentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But everywhere else in the world, they're, they're, they're double gone. the price. They're gone. Right. Gone, mate. Enzo's wow. as well. Really? Yeah, Enzo's around the world gone. So, I mean, not that either of us have that kind of money to be spending on a car, but depressing thought. So, yeah, Mission X, I think, look, I'm really excited about new era Porsche. I, I'm not going to sit here and bash it. There's so many products coming down the line that I can't wait for. I was disappointed because I had convinced myself there was going to be six new cars and we we're going to see this and we we're going to see that and endless things that we could buy. Uh, and yeah, we were just left with a concept that theoretically will come to production. But I also thought that the, the design was a little bit of a mishmash of some other cars. It wasn't necessarily Porsche enough for me. Um, but I, I still am um, yeah, waiting with great anticipation as to um, w- w- what is around the corner from that brand. And I think we're going to see a lot more cars released. Uh, just to touch on that, I've finally booked in a Sport Classic loan car. Have you? For later in the summer, which I can't wait for. I'm trying to work out what to do with it, that car. Because obviously, the old, it's kind of ultimate road-going GT car. I'm trying to think where to take it. I don't want to go for a million, but like maybe I'll do Scotland in it or something like that. I guess that would be a good test for it, wouldn't it? Like sort of north yeah, Drive coast it right to the coast inch. and right in the sea. D- oh, jog on. Um, <laughs> take I, it to Anglesey and go flat out and end up in the river. I'm a sea. good driver, so I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> one final car I want to touch on in the world of Porsche. Yeah which I'm going to do is a bit of a like a investment advice, uh, which we should never give and do not listen to this at all. Quirky car that I think might be one to keep an eye on. Boxster 25th anniversary edition. You know which one I mean by that? It's the GTS 4 litre Boxster, uh, limited by numbers. The one with the goldish wheels and the red interior. You know the one I mean? The stupid bubble at the back. It's got a stupid that, the, that bubble on the. I oh know that was a speech. No, one. yeah, yeah, just a normal, just a normal right. boxster, but it's right. the 25th anniversary, right. so limited delivery. So I say they all got red interiors. I think you could have it silver or black. How old? Paint. What? How old? It's a they? new car, GTS 4 liter. I mean, it came out last year or something. Like oh that. wow! Yeah, oh, yeah like okay, 25th right. anniversary, like brand new GTS 4 liter, right? But limited in numbers. Okay. Blah, blah. They're on the used market for sort of GTS price 66 grand, 68 grand, something like that. I think as and when they trickle down, because people don't seem to be paying them a lot of attention and they get to sort of late 40s, 50s, that could be a car that you could... Four litre car? It's a GTS four litre. It is a GTS four litre, but numbered. Sounds cheap to me, 60 or I agree. This is exactly what I'm saying. But, but, you know, especially if you look at sort of elsewhere, just the standard one, like people are really overlooking them. And if you look at limited numbered anniversary Porsches... Across the board, they're usually pretty good bets. I genuinely was looking at it, but like, I kind of almost, I mean, I do not need another two-seater car. I do not need another two-seater car. I do not need another two-seater car. But I was looking at it, like, that's a great summer car and something that I think you're going to be fairly all right in. I'm not going to tell you you're going to make money. I'm not going to tell you you're going to make money. But I think I think that's quite an interesting car. Right. Do you want well to go, go splitsies on that? No. No, okay. Um, well, where are we going in that? Anywhere looks great. You've got a couple of hairdressers with no hair. In that car together. <laughs> That's cliche. I think boxers are great cars. I love a boxster. Um, anyway, <laughs> that brings us an end to today's Le Mans focused episode. But uh, yeah, I had such a blast that we can. I, th- I just thought it was very interesting for what it means for yeah sports car manufacturers and just like you know it's it's a, yeah, a fascinating moment um as to whether it's actually important or not and that'll probably be the title of this episode you know ferrari lot one le mans do we care um <laughs> uh, uh, we will be back with you next week for our maserati press day special oh yeah which yeah. we were recording this week uh it's gonna be super interesting. i have no idea how that's gonna pan out by the way like we're just gonna go mic'd up and just get behind the wheels of stuff and just take you behind the scenes on a press day. Yeah. No holds barred. I'm doing a main channel video on the Gracali, Gracale, Trofeo. I'm going to learn how to bloody pronounce that, I guess, tomorrow. Um, so that'll be a main channel video. It'll be an honest review with Tony with me. So we'll, we'll give you true thoughts on that car. And then the podcast will follow up next week um, with, yeah, just, I guess, yeah, behind the scenes. We jump in and out of loads of different Maseratis. Oh, we'll and- smash it, mate. We'll have a good time. Yeah, lovely time. So yeah, subscribe to us now. If you're watching here on YouTube, turn on notifications so you don't miss all those future episodes. Um, and then if you're listening to us, you can keep doing so on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. Recast, stay tuned for early access to these episodes, including that Maserati episode. You'll get very early access to that one, I think. Um, and follow us on Instagram, behind the glass 
underscore underscore podcast. We've got a nice, new Instagram page. Yeah, building a nice little audience there for some, you know, reminder clips. Actually, I'm posting quite a funny one. You were just talking about EVs and tie cans. I posted quite a funny one um, about you talking about that about a couple of years ago. About Did I, have, has, has my opinion changed? Well, you ripped it apart. You said you couldn't oh, care no. less about it, but uh, <laughs> sounds a bit like the Mission X. So like, watch this space. Uh, anyway, we'll catch up with you next week. Bye-bye. See ya.